Good morning, Mount Sinai, and everybody that's joining us to this morning or today uh, or the coming week and listening to this sermon. I pray that uh, God will bless you, that it will enlighten your heart and help you to walk in a way that is pleasing in His sight. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come asking that you would guide our hearts and our minds that we may impart and receive that which you have blessed today. We pray that our minds will be focused on the main thing, not on uh, these women specifically in the text, but in the lesson that you want us to learn to not trust in man or ourselves, but to put our trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our text today comes from the same place it did last week, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, and it reads, the English Standard Version says, And seven women shall take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. Uh, we are working from a series titled Show Me Me. Uh, we're working through uh, the first chapter to chapter 6 uh, of Isaiah and hopefully we're getting a better picture of God and what he's doing to work things out for our good and how messed up we are and by seeing him we get a better picture of ourselves. But our specific subject for the day is uh, part two of trust Jesus in that day. Trust means to be firm or have firmness in faith. Your faith in someone is not weak, but strong, unwavering. Your trust in someone pr produces a steadfast within you that removes the desire or the need to lose your trust. The kind of trust that we are to have in Jesus is not governed by what's going on in our lives or all around us. Our trust in Jesus comes from within and is based upon our past experiences that grow out of what Jesus has done in our lives uh, previously. King David gives us a good example of this. Uh, he shows a trust that he has that is within that comes out of his experience while he was yet uh, a young lad uh, living in his father's house tending his father's sheep. He had an encounter with a lion and then uh, shortly thereafter another occasion uh, with a bear while tending his father Jesse's sheep. Shortly after these incidents, um, I'm, I'm just saying shortly after because of the sequence of time that they came, uh, David experienced being anointed by God's prophet. Uh, when God anoints, anointing is on us, we have a reason to put our trust in the Lord. When King David sinned with Bathsheba, uh, he still was confronted by his sins, and though it, through it all, God gave him a path beyond that irony. In Psalms 151, uh, after being confronted by uh, the prophet uh, Nathan in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7, uh, and Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. This is in response to a conversation he had guided David in about a man that had many uh, sheep, but he took a, one a man's sheep that only had one and uh, dressed it and had it for a meal uh, when he could have had any one of many. Uh, this is in response to the number of women available to David but yet he went and took one man, uh, a man that had only one wife. Uh, and David got angry, upset over the situation. He said, uh, bring this individual to me that would do such a despicable uh, thing. Bring him to me and I'll have his head. And, and uh, Nathan says to him, thou art the man. In life, 
it's good when we are confronted by our sins. And if we, if, if we would just open our hearts, God will confront us with our sins so that he can move us beyond our sinfulness. Uh, Proverbs, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms 51 is where we see uh, God's progressive means of moving beyond where we are. Uh, the king of Israel, David, said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitudes of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly uh, from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. For I acknowledge, that's a very important part, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. At this point, David sees himself and he acknowledges it. He sees him the way God sees him. Verse 4 says, Again, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And then drop down to verse 9. He asks the Lord, he says, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. Uh, o God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. God had taken his anointment away from uh, the person that David was replacing, King Saul, uh, and 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 at at that point, uh, uh, God had not only taken His Spirit from me. It's like being fired and not knowing you've been fired. You're still showing up on the job, but you've really been fired. That's the kind of situation that King Saul was in. But David, uh, remember something that always sticks out with me about King David and his relationship with uh, King Saul. He, he, David was the one that said. Touch not thine anointed one. In, in, in other words, leave God's anointed one up to God to deal with. So he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And, and King Saul had lost his uh, joy. And, and, and it's difficult to do anything by faith. And only what we do by faith is pleasing to the Lord. But in order to, to really have joy in working for the Lord, the Lord has to give you that joy. And he, as he gives it, he can take it away. Trust, again, is confident in something or someone. The Mississippi Mass Choir put it like this. He asked the question, why don't you put your trust in Jesus? Everything will be all right. He will make your path easy and your burdens will be light. All you got to do is have a little faith. Have a little faith in Jesus. Trusting Jesus, we find in Psalms 125 verse 1, it says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. In other words, there is steadfastness. We are unmovable. When I was a little boy, there was a song, uh, talking about being like a tree planted by the river that shall not be moved. That's the way we are. When hard times come upon us, when, when that day comes and, and we are confronted by it, we should be like a tree planted by the river that shall not be moved. We should be like uh, Mount Zion that cannot be moved but abides forever. And then Proverbs 3 and 5 says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into all thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. We start doing so much without checking with the Lord first, asking the Lord to, to help us. One of the things I remember from theological seminary school was uh, our teacher told us once about this story about uh, this father and his son. He says to the son, there's a big boulder out in the yard. I need you to go out and move it. The son went out and he started using his ingenuity to move the boulder. He worked and he sweated and he moved it. He, he worked. He did everything but move the boulder. 
The daddy told him before he went outside to move it, he says, don't forget your help. Don't forget your help. And, and, and that evening, after trying everything and it was totally exhausted, then he went inside and told his father, I've tried everything, but nothing I have done, I've been able to have not been able to move it. And his father asked him, did you use the help you've got? And he said, I tried everything. The father asked him, did you once come inside and ask me to help you? So often we try everything within our arsenal of knowledge, but acknowledging God, but checking with God, asking him to help us. In that day, when adversity comes upon us, how do we respond under pressure? What do we do when it appears that defeat is unavoidable? When all hope is lost, who do we turn to? When you find yourself in trouble, who will be with you? Psalms 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And here is the final end of our desire to avoid dependency, especially on Jesus we will become dependent in the most degrading and disadvantageous ways. It was beneath these women means to, to seven of them would agree to marry just one man. They would provide their own food and clothing just to be, have this man's name. That was a degrading situation. And whenever we strike out in life and, and forget to use our help, then we find ourselves depending in the most degrading and disadvantageous things. Sometimes when, when, when in that day, it shows up in the form of tribulation. And sometimes tribulation can seem as punishment for sin. Romans, twi um, Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter two, verse nine says, there will be tribulations and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jews first and also to the Greeks, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jews first and also to the Greek. Sometimes tribulations is seen as a part of life to be expected and tolerated. Romans 12 and 12 says, rejoice in hope and be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. John uh, 16 and 33 says, uh, as we go through life, uh, realizing that God's grace is a cause for rejoicing. John 16 and 33 says, I've told you that, I've told you all this so that trusting me, Jesus says, you will have unshakable and assured, deeply in peace, trust. He says, in this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I have conquered the world. Acts 14 and 22 says, strengthen the soul of the disciples. Uh, uh, this is uh, what Paul was saying. He said it to strengthen the souls of the disciples. He said this to encourage them to continue in faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. We're not going to be able to just waltz up into the kingdom of heaven, but through many tribulations. Sometimes tribulations is seen as a time of extreme crisis. Romans 8 and 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or swords? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, 
In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Second Timothy 3 and 1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. In the day of the Lord is the period of time when God will send judgment to the nations and purify Israel in preparation for the coming of his king to reign in our lives. It will be a time of terrible suffering. The environment will be devastated and millions of people will die. Could we be experiencing a foretaste, an example or sample of what God is trying to turn us away from? And, and we're turning a deaf ear to him? Could this coronavirus possibly be just an, a sample? You know how it goes when you go into a restaurant and uh, 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 especially when you're in one of those big malls and they have uh, uh, different uh, foods and they are, have somebody out front giving out samples. Maybe this is a sample of what is in our future if we don't learn to truly trust in the Lord. Two things and I'll leave you alone. Why will God judge his people? He will judge his people because of their idolatry, covetousness, uh, pride, exploiting of the poor. These are things that we find uh, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of uh, Isaiah. Instead of holding the truth of God's word, they are adopting superstitions, not unlike many religious seekers today. The growth of Eastern religions in the modern West world uh, is a phenomena that is both frightening and challenging. Even non-religious people are practicing Eastern forms of meditation and relaxation, following the techniques that are being taught in university classes and business seminars. It's even seen as a way to relieve stress by even pastors who never questioned the origin of such techniques. The prosperity of the nation made leaders proud and covetous. Instead of trusting the Lord, they trust their wealth and war equipment, not realizing that neither would deliver them in the coming days of judgment. The leaders were exploiting the poor, sounds familiar? Crushing them like grain in a meal. God will not allow his people to be proud and self-confident, but will humble them and cut them down like trees in the forest. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day when men flee from his wrath and discover the worthlessness of their idols and the consequences of their sins. In that day, Proverbs 28 and 1 says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as lions. Amos 5 and 19 through 21 says, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Just when you think you're getting away from danger, danger shows up. Verse 20 says, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Very dark and no brightness in it. And here's one a verse that I just throwed in uh, for the sake of, uh, uh, of awareness. Verse 21, perhaps there's some things that we, us church folks are doing that we don't realize that it just might not be pleasing to the Lord, maybe one day we will have to give an account. Verse 21 says, I hate, I despise your feast days 
and I will not smell in your solemn assembly. Feast days is another form of saying your annual days. <laughs> I need to let that sink in. Now let's move on. We've looked at why will God judge his people. Now, how will God judge his people? God will judge his people by taking away from them everything they were trusting, including food and water, leaders and soldiers, and judges and prophets. The entire support system of the nation would be disintegrated, and there would be no remedy. No one would want to hold offices except women and children. In Judah, male-dominated uh, male society, this would be a humiliating tragedy. The national leaders in Isaiah's day were charting a course that was out of the will of God and would ultimately bring disaster. Are the leaders of this world today that we're living in, in our society, is there being a course charted that's out of the will of God that will ultimately lead to disaster. But then in the midst of all of that, it says, but the righteous remnant would be protected by God. Glory, hallelujah. After denouncing the men in leadership, the prophet zeroes in on the proud women who profited from their husband's crime. The prophet Amos had a similar message for the women in the northern kingdom uh, in Amos chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Everything would be different for these women when the judgment of God came to the land. In that day, nobody would notice their expensive clothes, jewelry, perfumes, their elaborate hairstyles. They would be prisoners of war led by a rope like cattle going to the slaughter. So many men would be killed that there would not be enough husbands to go around. God is long suffering as he watches people viciously exploit one another and selfishly ravage his creation. But there is coming a day when unbelieving sinners will be punished and God's people will share in the glory of his kingdom. Again, just as last week, let me ask the question, in that day, will you be ready? Will God's people be ready? Second Corinthians three and five says, not that we are su sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Romans 7 and 18 through uh, verse uh, 25 says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the, for the good that I would do, or rather the good that I would not do, let me make sure I get this right. For the good that I would, I do not. There we go. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my member. And then I cry out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body 
of death. Verse 25 says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, flesh, I serve the law of sin. For by grace, we are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, what Paul is saying to the Ephesians in chapter two, verse eight and nine, he said, he's telling them, he's reminding them that one Friday on an old rugged cross, Jesus Christ died for our sins. They buried him in a borrowed tomb, but early the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. There's a song that goes like this, yield not to temptation for yielding is sin in that day. Each victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Shun evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence. Don't take it in vain. Be thoughtful and honest, kind-hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus, he'll carry you through. Or ask the Savior to help you, to comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. Jesus, he will carry you through. And that's it for today. Put your trust in Jesus in that day. And that day is this day and every day. Put your trust in Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, help us to always look in the right place for our help. Help us as the psalmist did in Psalms 121. He says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Thank you again, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And thank you for Mount Sinai and all that would give time that you've given to us to give ear to your word. Bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that's it. And we'll see you next time. So long.